Tara, thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to talk about this. Yeah, and I'd love to start, you know, you have, you've been in business for quite some time and I'd love to hear about your branding journey. How did you get started and what has gotten you to where you are today? Yeah, so it's 10 years this month that I've been in business for myself and the branding journey is probably the wildest one <laughs> that I've been on, both from, I think, from a business perspective, but also from a personal perspective as well. And I hope that we can get into some of that today. Um, but when I first got started, um, I thought that I wanted to be a blogger because 10 years ago, being a blogger was a thing. Um, and there were people that were full-time blogging and I had, I had started blogging actually in 2004 and just the idea of doing that full time, of writing for people, of sharing what was on my mind, of sharing what I was interested in, my passions for a living sounded just like an incredible uh, dream come true. Um, so I got started with blogging with a website called handmadeinpa.net. And the goal of that was to highlight sort of the new maker movement in Pennsylvania, which is where I live and where I'm from. And that website, though very niche, well, and maybe because it was very niche, uh, really took off sort of right away. Um, and it took off because I was very careful in the beginning, very smart in retrospect, although I had no idea what I was doing, of tapping people on the shoulder and saying, hey, this is what I'm doing. I think what you do is really cool. Can I write about you? Can I share your work? Um, can I connect you with other people? And just being really human and personal with it and creating something that was a little bit different in a space where there was literally nothing at the time. And so through that website, I got on the radar of a bunch of different organizations and people. Um, and two of the most important of those were the Pennsylvania Guild of Craftsmen, which really gave me my first um, taste of what it meant to teach other people how to use the internet, how to use social media, how to create a digital presence, how to create a, a digital brand for yourself. And I you know, was flying blind, but sharing what I knew, sharing my experience, sharing what I'd seen work for other people. And so there was that, and there was that relationship. And then the other person um, I got on the radar of was a woman who was running a blog at the time called Scouty Girl. It actually, the blog is still called Scouty Girl. I'm just not involved with it anymore. Um, and she said, hey, Tara, I can see that you've got a knack for this. You probably want to have a bigger platform and a, a wider reach than you have right now. Um, how about you purchase this blog for me? And I'm going to go about doing what I want to do more. And I said, you know, Jan, that sounds like a fabulous idea. <laughs> so within six months of starting to blog, I switched brands and took over this website called Scouty Girl and started talking more about indie business, the new maker movement, just sort of conscious capitalism um, you know, on a much broader basis. And from there, I was very quickly able to start making more money than I had made at my full-time job. Um, and I got paid pennies at my old full-time jobs. <laughs> So that it's, that's not some great feat of imagination or, or, or uh, innovation, but that kind of, that transition happened and, and the business became sort of a real thing at that point. It was something that I had proof of concept of. It was something that I could, I could say to my, my husband at the time, like, Hey, look, this is working. Um, what are we going to do to support this, to make this, to make this bigger, to allow me to do this more? And from there, things really evolved um, pretty quickly again. Um, and I started using my personal brand more and more. So started to use my name, started to represent myself as, as an expert, as a coach, as an advisor, as an instructor. And I spent the vast majority of the decade I've been in business in that space. So really utilizing a personal brand and really building myself as a strategist and coach and instructor of, of business um, sort of in general at large. Then in the last couple of years, I realized that there was a lot about the way I was doing business and the way I was representing my brand that didn't actually fulfill a lot of the sort of ethical and also just philosophical things that I actually believed about the way we could do business and about the way that we actually learned best. And so I started to pull back on my personal brand, still, you know, being visible, still representing myself, still showing up, but really trying to build something that was completely separate from me. Not something that was separate that is still my name, but something that was totally separate from me. 
starting to pull back on the expert thing, starting to pull back on the coach and strategist thing, and really focus on creating value in a way that wasn't dependent on what I knew or what I could learn or what I could teach. Um, and that has led us to where we are now, which is uh, that our, our company basically has a community-based model where we facilitate connection and conversation between business owners talking about what's working for them. Our goal is to not have that sort of, we know better than you, or we have the right answer to every question you have kind of philosophy, but instead to really affirm the resourcefulness and the experience and the wisdom and the knowledge of everyone who comes into our orbit, no matter how many years they've been in business, whether it's, you know, zero to one, or like many of our members, 10 to 20 years, uh, and really helping them connect and finding alignment where there is, um, really supporting diversity in our community, where we can support that, um, and so that there's as many different perspectives going on as possible, and so that people can really find their own way. So that community uh, today is called Co-Commercial, and I know we're going to get into that a little bit later, um, and uh, we do that through our, our sort of online community. We do that through mastermind groups, we do that through a retreat, um, and we do that also through our podcast called What Works. So I want to touch on a number of these things, but what was really interesting about what you said is how you shifted towards the expert to the community, because I think that many of us feel this pressure to have all the answers and to know everything. And so this, if this idea that, oh, I'm an expert, I should know everything there is to know about email marketing or Facebook ads or whatever it may be, when really all we know is what has worked for us and what worked for us may not work for other people. And so to have that hive mind where everyone can share what's working for them and people can make more informed decisions seems like such a smart and more, as you said, ethical move. Yeah. To me, it feels a lot more honest. I feel free to be honest every single day now. Um, you know, for a long time, I was, uh, I, I've taught 12 classes on a platform called Creative Live, and I've taught them on everything from marketing to hiring to goal setting and planning to pricing and business models. And so I have really been represented as this sort of small business expert in all these different areas. And while I know a lot about running small business, and I have a lot that I can teach people and a lot that I can share, not just from my perspective, but from others as well, it doesn't mean I have all the answers to every question. And when you're on a stage like that, whether it's a company like Creative Live putting you on that stage, or whether as you know, we're kind of taught to do, whether we're creating that stage for ourselves on Instagram, on Facebook, on our blog, on our podcast, we're looked at as if I answer, if I ask you a question, you're going to have an answer for that. And the truth was most of the time, the answer was it depends. Or, you know, I don't know for sure, but let me point you in the direction of these resources. And I got tired of one, saying it depends, and two, <laughs> um, you know, not being dishonest, but not being able to be fully honest with people. And so the space that we're really trying to create and the culture that we're really trying to create through our brand and our community is about that full transparency and full honesty that I don't have all the answers, you don't have all the answers, but together, uh, at the more we share about what's working, about what our experience is, what we've seen work for other people, the more information that we, we have so that it, exactly like you said, we can make better decisions for ourselves. Yeah. And it's one thing to detect patterns in your own work, but to detect patterns with a group of hundreds of people, yes. you have much better information. Exactly. And I want to dive into all of this, but I have a real quick, just add for my own curiosity, what is the process like for buying a website or a blog? Like what was... <laughs> That's such an interesting thing because so many of our listeners are working from the ground up to develop their own brands, their own audience, their own mailing list. What was it like to kind of step into somebody else's pool and take over? Yeah, so it was, this was a very special situation, um, although I've now seen it over the, the years happen many times. So this was a situation where, yes, there was a single person associated with this blog, but there were also multiple writers. And so she brought me on as a writer first, so she kind of introduced me to the community that way, um, and then kind of 
pr essentially promoted me in that purchase um, as the head of the site. And so we kept on a lot of the same writers for a long time. Um, and then my voice just kind of grew into that. Um, and logistically, there's lots of different ways that you can purchase an existing business. One of the easiest ways to do it is to find yourself a broker, someone who actually does that for a living. And there are people who that's what they do. They broker and facilitate the sale of existing businesses. Um, but, you know, we just kind of fumbled our way through it at the time. There were a lot of handshakes. There were some agreements. And also at the time, because this was 10 years ago, there were a lot less moving parts. So the two main things we had to worry about were moving her type pad account to my name. <laughs> That's fun. Um, and then also the RSS feed, like getting her feed burner credentials and taking over that account. So things that we don't worry about anymore <laughs> today. Um, now, because I actually then sold Scouty Girl later, a, a few years later, um, you know, I had a lot more considerations then. Then it was handing over the mailing list and prepping the mailing list for that transfer. Um, there were domain names that needed to be switched. Then there was hosting that needed to be changed. And so it was a little bit more intensive at that point. And then legally speaking, we got way more into it um, in that second sale. But yeah, it's a fun, it's a fun process. And I think that it's one that people don't think about as an option. Like we're all, like you said, we're all building things from the ground up. And there's actually a lot of opportunity to find something that's, that is already working um, and take it over for yourself. I was listening to um, Pat Flynn's SPI podcast mm -hmm. and he had someone on that was a broker for online businesses and it just got my wheels spinning. He said that there's a site that lists all the things that are up for sale and I'm looking through, I was like, Ooh, that would be like so much fun to do, totally. uh, but not at, not at the moment, but it, it's something that now is like kind of rattling around in the back of my head. Yeah. So let's talk about the online community. So you've launched this online community. Um, how is it structured? How do you keep it fresh? I know you have team members that manage the, manage the community and you're in the community as well. Talk a little bit about what is working <laughs> in co-commercial. Yeah. So um, I'll start off by saying that our community site is a community site. It is an online community and it is not um, what is often touted as sort of like the new business model for online businesses, which is a membership site where there is a content library and there are resources and it's essentially just an online course that you keep paying for. <laughs> um, I made a really conscious decision two years ago um, to actually remove all of the content, remove all of the resources that we had stored in a library as part of what was a membership site and really to highlight the value proposition of just connecting with other small business owners. Now, that's not to say that then there isn't a lot of value to it. Of course, there's, there's value in those connections. There's value in that conversation. But at the same time, we do a lot to direct that conversation because it can be really overwhelming to step into any new community, whether it's online or offline. And so we want to create touch points for people. So our biggest job in structuring that and running that community is really thinking about what are those touch points that we can use, those, the rituals, the events, the opportunities uh, that we have to bring people together and give them something to talk about. Um, because for a lot of people, they're not comfortable asking for help. They're not used to being vulnerable. They're not used to sharing what's working for them without putting a price tag on it. And so we create a lot of sort of containers for doing that, for practicing that. And then that trickles down into the community where people see, okay, that was really fun that we were talking about this thing. Now I want to talk about this other thing over here, or I'm going to write an article and I'm going to share what's working for me because I so appreciated when someone else shared what was working for them. Um, and so we're constantly just trying to reward good behavior and uh, ignore bad behavior, um, although we don't have to deal with that very much. And really just, like I said, creating those containers. The other thing that we really focus on as a team is what the culture of our site is. So you mentioned, you know, we do have team members and so they're constantly in there trying to nurture the culture that our members are building. And then another important piece of it is that I'm in there as a member as well. So one of the touch points of our culture is that I am 
not an expert. As I said, I'm not there to be your coach. You're not here to get access to me, but that doesn't mean I don't participate. I participate a lot. I freaking love online communities. I'm 36 years old and the internet is online communities to me, right? Like from Prodigy to American Online, America Online to all the things, like I just want to hang out on the internet and talk to people. So that's how I approach it. And so we talk about me being the founder and super user in our community as opposed to being the expert or the go-to. And what that's done is allowed me to practice saying, hey, this is what's worked for me. Here's what I see working. Um, in my experience, this is how things play out or this is what's played out in, in my experience as opposed to always having to teach, always having to create new content, always having to build a new resource for people. So we put zero time into that and just all of our time into interacting with people, modeling good behavior, rewarding good behavior, and creating those cultural touch points that creates a structure where people have the freedom to interact in that community in the way that serves them best. It, if the, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> 100%. Okay. And I love that how intentional you were with all of your messaging from your title to how you talk about the community, how you interact, because I think that in that messaging, it not only attracts the right type of community member, because it's obviously this isn't for everybody. In order to cultivate a community, you need to be mindful of who's joining. And But it also helps when you're building out a team, if there's that consistency, it's a lot easier to quote, clone yourself or have more team members that are going to be answering questions in the way that you would answer them or speak to members in the way that you would speak to them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Our team members, just how I'm not there to be an expert or an advisor, our team members who have different kinds of experiences, but you know, they've never been a business coach. They've never been a, a small business expert. They're free to go in and exactly as you said, you know, answer questions in a similar way, but from their own perspective to what I would do. Um, and so, yeah, it's a lot easier to have other people in there modeling great behavior. And then, you know, we have members who have been around for years because sort of co-commercial evolved out of a membership site that we've been running for, um, I guess it's been six plus years now. And so we've got members who have literally been around all of those six plus years. And so they're in there doing the same thing. So even though I don't pay them, <laughs> they are... Uh, they're sort of part of our team. They're part of the leadership in our community and they help to really nurture and create that culture that's important to us as well. And so talk about how the mastermind and the retreat fits into the membership site. What's the flow? Are the members different? How does that work? Yeah, great question. So the for us, our masterminds and our mastermind and retreat are very much a continuation of the value proposition that we have at Co-Commercial. It's just a different level of service, essentially. So we don't even like to think about it in terms of, of features or, and again, not definitely not in terms of access. It is a different level of service. It's more hands-on. It's more it happens more frequently, like there's more um, sort of structural accountability to those programs. So with the masterminds, our structure there, or our value proposition there are facilitated conversations. So just like in the community where I'm a, a, a super user, in our mastermind groups, I have a seat at the table just like everybody else. The only difference in my role is to be the facilitator there. And so again, it's a, it's a role that someone else could step into as well. Our job, you know, my job there is to make sure everybody talks. Everybody who has something to contribute, contributes. It's to tap people on the shoulder and say, hey, I know you have an experience with this. I need you to talk about that now. Or hey, I know you're having a challenge and you're sitting on your hands because you're scared to share it, but I need you to share that right now because it's going to help other people. Um, and just kind of cross-pollinating those ideas. And it's a, it's a role that I absolutely love. Like I'd much rather be a facilitator than a teacher. One of my strengths is as a, as a connector. And so that, that connecting of ideas and of people is really like, it just really jazzes me. So we have two different kinds of, of masterminds. One is a more frequent um, small group where it's sort of like a round robin hot seat kind of thing. Very traditional sort of mastermind style, which is not to say that it's 
the style of mastermind that's popular in the online business space today, which is again, largely an uh, just an excuse to charge more money for an online course <laughs> um, or for group coaching. And so we are, we are, there's no curriculum. We're just sitting down at the virtual table and saying, all right, you go. What's on your mind? What's challenging you? What's your obstacle? And then getting other people to weigh in. Um, and like I said, I'm actively facilitating that. And then we have another mastermind um, that includes a, a three-day re in-person retreat. That group meets on a monthly basis. Um, and there's a combination sort of, of group discussion of the same kind of small group hot seating. And so it's, it's pretty similar. It just has that extra fun feature of we get to go to Montana and drive through Glacier National Park and hike around and have drinks and it's super fun. Um, and so, yeah, so like I said, I mean, those masterminds to me really are just an extension of everything we do at Co-Commercial. It's a very similar type of business owner. It's a very similar type of culture. It just is, is a higher level of service that we provide. And when I saw that mastermind or the retreat on your website, I was like, ooh, I want to go to Glacier National <laughs> Park. That looked amazing. Yeah. And what I loved about it is that you're combining, you know, you say on your website, you have a love of hiking, love of the outdoors. And so I love that you chose a retreat location that meshes with you and that speaks to you. So even though you're saying that, you know, anyone could do this, I'm just the facilitator this program really has a lot of you in it. Yeah, I think that's a very astute observation. So when I talk about moving away from a personal brand and building something that is outside of me, it doesn't mean that I've abandoned the things that make me, me. <laughs> it doesn't mean that I'm trying to construct something contrived or arbitrary. I am still very much building something that is based on my values, my philosophies, what I see going on, what I see working, uh, what my interests are, what my personality is. And I try to build that into literally everything that we do, because if I don't, I will lose interest in it and then it will disappear and people won't be happy. So, um, so you're exactly right. I mean, this retreat is the retreat that I want to go to. The masterminds are the style that I want to participate in. Um, and I think that there's a lot of value in it. Like you said earlier, it's not for everyone. And we try and make that as abundantly clear as possible. Although most people just self-select out at the very idea of these things. But yeah, I mean, I'm not the kind of person who, like I enjoy sitting by the pool in uh, Mexico as much as the next person, but it's not how I want to spend my business retreat. It's not how I want to spend three days. Like I like to do that for a day. What I like to do for days on end is enjoy the mountains, enjoy the scenery, get out and move my body, have conversations in, in an environment that you can't help but be expansive in. Um, and so that's how we've really designed the retreat. And we've done it twice now. This will be our third year. Um, and both years has just been the most mind-blowing experience for me. And I know it's been mind-blowing for our participants, but I think that that's in, something that's really important for me as an entrepreneur and as a creator and as a thinker is that I need to be able to create experiences and opportunities, whether online or offline, that have that kind of transformational power for me as well as for the client or customer. It's funny that you said that because we, uh, I had on a couple of weeks ago, uh, Kelsey Chapman, who I met in a group coaching mm -hmm. business incubator thing, and we had we've known each other for several months and we met up and we were both saying that we wanted to do group programs. And it looked like we were actually modeling both of our group programs off of the one that we had such a great experience mm -hmm. in. And so it's interesting how that, that effect trickles down that when you go through a really good experience, you're like, oh, I wish someone else would do this for me, or this is, I went through this experience. It was really good, but I wish these four things had been done differently. Then you can create that for other people. Yes, exactly. So for those um, listeners who are interested in doing either an on, launching an online community, launching a mastermind, uh, another business incubator, what are some qualities you found make for a really dynamic, loyal, productive commu online community? Yeah, that's a great question and a really hard question. So the first thing I'll say is 
you really need to understand what your relationship to the online community is going to be or the mastermind group or whatever it is, whatever that community experience is that you want to build. You have to think, what are, what is my relationship going to be to that community as a whole? And what is my relationship going to be to the individual people? Because your relationship to that group and to those people are really going to be what drives a huge amount of that experience. And if you're not very careful, you can get yourself into a hole. And that's what I see go wrong with so many brands that are very expert or coach or uh, teacher based who want to build more of a conversational kind of community space is what happens is it's still a one to many model. And um, something that I came came across um, from Alex Hillman, who does a lot of work um, in the co-working space and community building in the co-working space, is he talks about um, not just transitioning from one uh, to many, but then transitioning, or sorry, not just transitioning from one to one to one to many, but also transitioning from many to one to many, which is often what happens in that kind of more traditional membership space. And so what he talks about is going from many to many. And that's where, for me, the real brilliance happens in a community where the value is actually happening from the group talking to each other and not the group talking to me. But in order to create that experience, I have to know what my role is. I have to know what my relationship is and I have to stay in that lane. (laughs) I cannot tell you how many times I have been tempted over the last two years to be like, well, you know what would make this easier? I'm just going to teach a workshop or I'm going to, I'm going to offer coaching or I'm going to add more Q&A calls with me. No, 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 no. Every single time I try and do something like that, it makes our value proposition confused. It makes our community confused. It shuts down conversation. It, it reduces the amount of magic that happens on a daily basis. So I have to be really, really clear on that role and I have to be willing to stay in that lane. And I also have to tell my team members to slap my wrist if I start getting out of that lane. This is very, very important. It's um, hard though. It's yeah. really hard when, you, when you've been in business for so long and you know so many things. It is hard to remember, okay, step back and let's see if some of the community members can answer it in a way. And if someone is giving terrible information, I can step in. It's not the end of the world, but like, I, I have that, I have that tendency to, to just want to know it all and tell everyone and always be the person as opposed yeah. to saying, Hey, you, you know about this. You went through this. What was your experience like? And trying to make that conversation happen without you. Yes. So that is like nitty gritty logistical tip. That is my go-to thing. And that's what our team members do as well. So instead of me supplying the answer, instead of one of our team members supplying an answer to a question, because whenever we intercede in a conversation, we know that shuts things down or it turns all of the attention on us, which is not where we want that to be. So we're constantly tagging people in to conversations. We're constantly saying, all right, you have something to contribute or you five people have something to contribute. We want to hear from you. Um, The other thing that I will just do is just sit on my hands, which is really because, and I'll literally sit on my hands. Like I cannot participate in this conversation yet. There needs to be three or four people in here first, and then I'll share my experience. Because again, every time I share, it has a tendency to shut things down. Now, over time, that's gotten a lot better. Um, and the these more and more solid and, and well-structured our value proposition is and our culture is, the less that happens. So I get to chime in a little bit more now. But at the beginning, I really had to be very conscious about, all right, I need three, I need five people to share first, then I can jump in and I can connect and facilitate from that conversation that's already happened instead of just saying, this is the way it is. So that's the, that's, I think that's the biggest thing. Um, I think the other piece is, and it's kind of related, but it's like getting out of the way. Um, we often think that the way we create value is by telling people what we know or by being transparent, sharing what we, what works. And that's true. And also there are lots of ways to create value that you know maybe take 140 characters. So for instance, one of the things that we found gets the most conversation going in our community and 
bleeds out in a good way to the rest of our space is just asking questions. So we use a platform called Mighty Networks uh, to host our community. And one of their features is just sort of asking like a, a short poll question. So like this month, we're talking about habits and routines um, because it's the new year. We didn't want to talk about resolutions. We didn't want to talk about goals. So habits and routines. And so literally, um, you know, our member experience specialist, Kristen, posts one single sentence, what new habit are you working on in 2019? Or what habit did you eliminate in 2019? And then we get, you know, 30, 40, 50 different answers. People are talking back and forth. Then they go off and they, ha they start another conversation on their own. And all we did to create that value was simply ask the question. And so that's been a big learning for me in what it, what it takes to build the kind of community that we want to have is often doing less, not doing more. And so for 2019, one of our goals is to re-examine the way we manage things and see, okay, what are the things that actually create the most value and then eliminate everything else? Even if you know some people like them or sometimes uh, they get interaction or we really like them. If it's not creating that kind of value, we really just want to focus on those couple of things that get people doing the things that are creating the most value, that are uh, facilitating conversations, that are building the culture that we really want to have. It reminds me kind of when I was younger and I would ask like my mom, I would read something in a book and I asked my mom like, what does this word mean? And she would tell me to go look it up. Mm -hmm. And this idea that you're telling, you're forcing people to find the answers for themselves yes. versus just telling them, I think is a really, going back to the, the way people learn, I think that it's a really important thing that they're going to get a lot more out of it by forcing them to think about, okay, well, how do I do that? How did I do that? Or even the community members teaching each other versus the experts swooping in, just here's the right answer. Go with yeah. it. Yeah. Yes. And I, this is so, 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 so important to me because what we've, what excuse me, what we as an online space have done over the last five, 10 years is really create a culture of advice and expertise. Um, and in many ways, that culture is actually counter to the way we learn best and the way we like to operate because we're we're like, we're in business for ourselves because we're self-starters, we're autodidacts, like we like teaching ourselves things. And yet... The message we have been hit over the head with over and over and over and over again is I have the right answer. You need to come to me. I know something that you don't. I'm going to teach it to you for a price. And so we've, we've taught ourselves to rely on others instead of continuing to hone the things that got us into business in the first place. And so what we're really doing or what we're trying to really do consciously is rewrite that advice culture into a community learning model culture so that we can actually get back to learning the way we learn best, experiencing things the way we experience them best so that we can make the best decisions, each one of us for ourselves. And it goes back to what you said at the beginning, you know, what worked for one person may not work for your community. Yes. I was a, I was in a beta test. A, a woman I know said she was launching um, a email marketing course and needed like some people to go through it. And I was like, sure, I'd be happy to give you feedback on the course and, and to put your stuff to the test. And what I found really tough is that there was, it was just very rigid and like, these are the six emails you need to make the sale. And this is why. And in my mind, I'm like, well, but what if you don't, what if some communities need these emails and other communities just want that one email or the two emails, you know, not everyone. It's the same with the webinar formula of launching via webinar. I, I completely trashed that. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I mean, I launched, actually we did, as of this recording, we did a webinar yesterday that had a 5% conversion and the amount of teaching I did was very little, but it was all questions. It was mm. leading them through a series of questions that they mm -hmm. had to answer for themselves that would get them to the answer of what they needed to do. Again, everyone is different. So every, the formula isn't going to be the same, but that's what we're striving. We're stri a lot of people are wanting that if I follow steps one through 10, I will get to where I need to go. But if your journey is completely different and the destination is completely different and your audience is completely different, you can't expect to follow someone else's formula or roadmap in order to get there. 
Yes. And I think what's so funny about that, though, is that the people who want that blueprint, that formula, that framework, that one, two, three step plan are the same people who, if you ask them, like, are you like, are you more independent or less independent? Are you um, do you like authority? Or do you do not like authority. They're the people who are going to say, I, oh, I am totally uh, I am totally liberated. I really can't stand authority. I don't like people telling me what, I, what to do. I like to figure things out for myself. And yet we have trained them to ask us for those blueprints. And so, and so that, that piece drives me crazy. And I think that we're going to see a market correction in that. Um, and I think, but I think it's going to take time. And there are, but there are people right now who are really waking up and saying, all right, you know what? No, I do believe I'm the best person to figure this out. But how the heck do I do that? And so we're trying to be an answer to that. Um, not the answer to that, but an answer to that. And we're trying to build a culture that kind of helps people recognize that again, because I think we've really gotten away from our own best strengths as small business owners and as entrepreneurs. Agreed. And I think the market will correct itself because I think that the, the systems that used to work are no longer working. Yeah. Like the email, you know, the email marketing, how you build your list those things aren't work. Those typical things are not working in the same way that they used to. So everyone needs to correct the lead generation. All those things are changing. And so I think that, I think it will correct because again, none of us have the answer anymore because it's changing so quickly. How can anyone know exactly the right answer? So by having this hive mind of hundreds of people who have done this and they're like, what are you seeing in email marketing? What are you, what's going on with your Facebook ads? What's going on with your Instagram algorithm? Um, whatever it may be. So yeah. I think it will, I think it will start changing because the, the market's changing so quickly that no one is going to be able to keep up enough to be a quote unquote expert. Totally. I completely agree. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, your podcast is what works. And then as of this not as of this recording, but as of this airing, you're making a shift with your membership site and your mastermind. Can you talk a little bit about what that shift is and what motivated you to do so? Yes. So, um, yeah, as I said to you, I think before we started recording, uh, branding, the idea of like who I am, what the story is, has always been in constant shift, as I think it is for most of us. So the story with our podcast is that I started it uh, three plus three and almost three and a half years ago now with um, that company Creative Live that I mentioned earlier. And we co-produced it for two years. Um, and at that time, it was called Profit Power Pursuit. And what I really discovered that I loved about podcasting was the opportunity to ask people what was working for them. Like, I'm not here for your story. I'm not here for advice. I just want to know, what are you doing right now that's working? Uh, whether it's pricing, whether it's product development, what is it, business model, marketing, whatever it might be, like let's laser focus on one of those things and let's talk about how you do it and what's working for you. Um, so earlier uh, in 2018, so April 2018, we took the podcast over from them, uh, very amicably amicably. Um, it was really good for both of us. And we rebranded it then to What Works, which uh, we stumbled on in a feat of, of brilliance <laughs> at some point, just throwing around names. What could we call this? Um, and it's I love it. Thank you. Love yeah, the name. I mean, it says what it is. We're a podcast about what, what works, not just um, from my perspective, but from our guest's perspective. And it's also a question. What works? We don't know. Let's talk about it. Um, and of course, we talk about what's not working um, and those things as well. And so that that name, that concept, that idea, as that's really gelled, we've begun to see our entire value proposition, our culture, the structure of everything we do through that lens of what works. So um, still in flux right now, um, but what we are moving into is really um, owning what works as our story and as the way we want to represent ourselves as a company and our community and just everything that we're doing uh, in this space. So um, our community that has been called co-commercial is becoming what works the network. So we'll just simply be the network uh, along with what works um, and our masterminds will because they've never really had their own name. <laughs> we'll just kind of come along for that journey as well. 
what we love about it is that instead of trying to give meaning to what is something that is very meaningful to me, um, which is this concept of co-commercial, what works kind of comes with meaning associated with it already. It says what it is. It says what we talk about. It says what we are about, what our culture is. Um, and so we're really excited about being able to be that just upfront about who we are and what we do and what we're all about. Um, and so while this is a big change for us and it's yet another rebrand in the history of my rebrands, um, this is probably the one I am absolutely most excited about because it feels so concrete to me. It feels like it's a done deal. It feels like like it is, it just already is what we do and who we are. And so just, we're just changing the name. Um, and that's what I'm most excited about. I think it's incredibly smart. Um, there was a business owner who had told me because I have the PR company and they also have this other platform branding outside the box and it's different audiences or so I thought, but <laughs> treating it as this ecosystem, as opposed to these separate entities where you had the podcast and then the business it's now more integrated and people can easily go from one to the other all under the same umbrella. Right. And we've always thought about it as an ecosystem, but the connection wasn't as strong. Like our community members got it, but the outside world didn't get it. And because we need more of the outside world on the inside world, <laughs> um, you know, we decided it makes a lot of sense to make it work like that. Um, and so, yeah, so everything's going to be changing like that. And I just, I'm so excited. I have a lot of work to do yet, <laughs> um, but I'm really, really excited about it. But if it's just a name, if the messaging is staying consistent, yes. if, you know, it's, it's just the name, it's, it seems like it's a lot of administrative, like, domain names and handles and that sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, we are using it as an opportunity to really freshen up the website and things like that as well. But I always look at website development as very iterative. I'm not one of those people who unveils a you know $15,000 redo on a website because three weeks later, I'm just going to want to make a big change again. <laughs> so websites are always sort of in flux with us. Um, so there is some work there that goes, but you're exactly right. It literally is like, okay, so point this domain over here now and this domain over there now and we're done. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's the meat of it. Well, and it seems like it's, again, a very smart and mindful decision. You're not just changing the name to give you know, a refresh or something. I think I was, no. oh yeah, it was convert kit that drove me crazy when they're like, yeah. we're going to change our names to this yoga pose or whatever it is. Um, and they're like, just kidding. We're not going to do that. Cause it was a silly idea. It's, it seems like it's very, it makes a lot of sense. And it seems like it's the, it's a no brainer really. Yes, I agree. Very cool. So I have to ask you now, Tara, what works? <laughs> Oh, man. Well, you know, what's on my mind in terms of what's working right now is habits and routines. I mentioned that's kind of our theme for, for this month, uh, for January 2019 inside of the network. But it also is something that I have been thinking about personally for the last couple of years now. I've made a lot of personal changes to the habits and routines that I have. I've made changes to the business habits and routines that I have. And so, you know, because it's January and because I love this kind of New Year's energy as much as possible, it's yet another opportunity to reevaluate what habits are productive for me and what habits are unproductive for me. What is it that I need to eliminate? What is it that I need to change dramatically in order to uh, realize a new level of functioning <laughs> or performance. Um, and so that's what I'm, that's what I'm looking at right now. And that's what's been working for me is just really honing the habits that create the action that I know is necessary to execute on what we want to create. So whether that's my fitness habit, whether that's food habits, or um, whether it's a habit of posting on social media every day because I can so easily forget to do that just like the next person. I can so easily try and wait until I have something important to say and instead just really getting in the habit of showing up on a daily basis, being visible on a daily basis, asking questions on a daily business. Um, so I'm, I'm really working on that habit. I'm working on a habit of bullet journaling right now. So that's another thing that I'm finding already 10 days, we're 10 days in. Um, it's working for me now, just making sure that my priorities my to-do list, my schedule is at the top of my mind because it's in front of my face all day long. What other habits are really working for me right now? Um, and just checking in with my team. I'm 
very much an introvert. I am very much someone who likes to be left to their own devices. And so it, as a manager, that's one of my biggest areas of opportunity is just to make sure that I'm making myself available and to make sure that I am actively checking in with the people on my team. I don't do it well enough. I will fully admit that right now, but it's a habit that I'm trying to get into. I share I share your pain as a fellow introvert. <laughs> I would work happily in my hobbit hole and uh, not check in with anybody or also you know, our team, my, my wife works in corporate and manages a huge team. So she helps me with that. And she's like, it doesn't take that. It's not that big of a deal to chit chat. Yeah. Oh, but I have so much to do. And she's like, it doesn't take that much to chit chat a little bit. And your team feels a lot better. Even just like G chatting in the middle of the day. Like, did you see that, that announcement? Oh, or did you see that article? Whatever it is, just to let them know that you're there makes a big difference. That's also something I am working on is not just always needing to get down to brass tacks all the time. Yes. I love how your wife put that because that is literally what I remind myself on a daily basis is this small talk might be painful to you, but the effect of it, the results of it is so huge. It is completely worth that five minutes of your time or that 10 minutes of your time. You weren't going to get one more thing done. This is really important. (laughs) And I feel that on the other side too, we were signing with a new client and I was telling her, I was like, I don't, I can't read this guy. And she's like, well, what do you know about him? I'm like, nothing. He just wants to talk business. And, and she's like, let's see. Ah. I like, oh, I didn't think I needed it. But now even that like one thing about something personal or something that's happening will help connect. And I'm like, yes. okay, this is, this is the importance as opposed to just getting a call going through a contract or going through a to-do list. It's yes. a different feeling. Well, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, so domain, is that cha- the domain name changing? Is it just going to be whatworks.com now? Uh, I wish whatworks.com was available, but it is <sighs> so not available. So um, I believe it's going to be explorewhatworks.com, um, but you can definitely find our podcast and the redirects will happen at whatworkspodcast.com. So If in doubt, because I don't think the domain name and and things are going to be changed over by the time we air this um, interview, Um, although we'll be making steps in that direction, I can absolutely guarantee that whatworkspodcast.com will take you somewhere in our ecosystem that you want to be um, and will most likely take you to exactly uh, the place where you can kind of dive in with out any, um, without any, uh, paywalls in your way, without any email addresses being asked for in your face, just dive into our content. Um, if you're interested in it. And I think that you'll, you'll really see what our perspective is and what our philosophy is on, on how we should be talking about small business and what works. Awesome. And we'll link to everything in the show notes at brandingoutsidethebox.com slash podcast. So we can keep updating that the show notes as, um, as this goes forward. So if you're listening to the podcast, like six months from now, and you don't know what link to go to, just go to the show notes. It will be updated. Tara, thank you so much for spending this time with me. Yeah, absolutely. This has been a blast.